Amen. Check one, check one, check one. Good. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Stand to your feet tonight. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. I'd rather be here than outside. Amen. All right. Are y'all ready to be our test subjects tonight? Yeah. We've got two brand new original songs. Two brand new original songs. You've never heard them before. You're about to hear them. This uh, first song is, uh, is a song about what God gives us. I'm so glad that the Word of God tells me that His grace is more than my sin. Amen. 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 And so for that reason tonight, I want to sing a song of how He has given us grace. All right?
grace that covers me. Her love has set me free. Gave me grace. How many is thankful for that grace? Let's sing it again. You give me all that I need. My life belongs to you. I want to show what you mean. I just want you to just catch this for a moment. This is a song we all participate in. Lord, we want your holy fire. If we burn, we'll burn with holy fire. Baptize us in your
just come tonight, God. God, we come asking that you will baptize us, God. Baptize us in your fire, God. Mm. Remove every impurity out of our lives, God. That our lives will be a living testimony, God. God, that our lives will change the culture of this nation and of this world, God. We stand in awe of your presence, God. For it was your grace, God, that redeemed us from the curse. And for that, we tell you, thank you, God. Now, God, as your manservant, come to release your word in this place. Move every distraction, God. Help us to be attentive unto your word, God. Let your word find a place on good soil, God. God, that it will bring increase, God, a hundredfold, God. But this is our desire tonight. Keep our eyes fixed and focused on you, God, knowing you are a God that cannot fail, God. Anoint the man of God afresh and anew as he release your word in this place and into our lives. We thank you now, God, for everything that you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated tonight. Pastor Tim, how are you today, my brother? Wonderful man of God. How about Hallelujah. you? Good, good, good. All right, I want to tell you right now, you can submit your prayer requests both online and in person at this time, okay? Uh, if you're online, you can put it in the chat, put it in the comment section. If you're here in person, just drop it back there in the prayer box tonight. All right, reminder, services are always available online with Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Wednesday and 10 a.m. Sunday. Then on YouTube by 8 p.m. Wednesday and 12 p.m. Sunday. Please share. We need you to keep sharing. That's how you can share the gospel. 
Hallelujah. All right. There are plenty of ways to give tonight. If you cannot attend, you can give on our website, cfcsandycross.com. There's a giving feature there. You can also get the Share Faith app. The download instructions for both Apple and Android are on the website as well as the Facebook page. And you can get a hard copy at Connect Corner. But you can also mail in your donation to Christian Fellowship Church, 7814 South NC, Highway 58 Elm City, North Carolina, 27822. Again, thank you for your faithfulness. You can give in person now by safely dropping your tithe and or offering in an usher's bucket or by simply using your mobile device from your seat tonight. Stop by our Holy Grounds Cafe on your way out tonight. They'll always have something there for you. And remember, it's open one hour before service. All visitors, if we have any tonight, please turn in your slips to the Connect Corner after service. I want to give a big thanks to all the men who supported the Men's Fellowship this past Sunday. It was a great time, great word. What an on-time, on-time teaching we received uh, from Michael Bacon. And, man, I'll never forget it. So we're so blessed for that. Uh, Friends in Community Day honoring the Cooper's Community Development Organization or the Miracle Park team, as we say. That's Sunday, October 3rd at 10 a.m. There'll be a youth staff meeting right after that with me and Pastor Tim. We're going to encourage you that day, and we're going to feed you too, okay? So we're looking forward to that. King's Kids movie night is October 8th, 6 to 8.30 p.m. Trunk or Treat. 6.30 to 8.30, Wednesday, October 27th, and it goes on and goes on. we got a lot to look forward to, amen. We'll stop there for tonight. Uh, It is time to start preparing your annual shoebox blessing for Samaritan's Purse. If you don't know about that program, you can get with Billy Joe. Uh, She's our missions director as well as Joy Meadows, our uh, children's minister, and she uh, can help you with that, all right? Okay, at this time, the King's Kids and Junior King's Kids and the Fusion Middle and High School can be dismissed. Amen. Can we thank our leaders tonight for their time? We have a lot to be in prayer for tonight. Amen. So much to be in prayer for tonight. And I want to get to that. Uh, But nevertheless, God knows our need. God knows it. God's will is being done in those needs, and we're going to get ready to update you on some prayers here in a moment, and, um, but let's, let's show him tonight that we're going to put him first, amen, and we're going to trust him in faith that he's taking care of all these things we're praying for tonight, amen. Let's go to Matthew 18, is that fair? Matthew 18, trust you, Jesus, you're taking care of our loved ones tonight. Hallelujah. All right. I am so glad to be in here with y'all. I have looked forward to this all day long. I just love church, man. I am a churchaholic. Got a problem. Hallelujah. Y'all help me. Pray for me. I just love this place. And I love y'all. Amen. When we've acquired kingdom vision and perspective in our lives, and we've allowed God to make our very lives a kingdom trigger, and we've sought kingdom doors of destiny, and we've kept a vision of victory in Christ Jesus, then we've established and begun to implement a kingdom culture. Can I get an amen? We are called to aid in setting up his kingdom upon earth, thereby creating a kingdom culture in how we function from thinking, speaking, reacting, and all around living. Just look in the Amish country up north. Many of you I know have traveled there. How about Chinatown or Little China in New York City or or Native American Indian reservations throughout the entire country? They have set up a place that functions accordingly with their culture. We are citizens of another place. So it's our job to set up the culture of that place here on earth. And here's what it's going to look like. Increased faith. Intense motivation, joy unspeakable, Christ-like compassion, creative thinking, and holy boldness. Amen. When I think of those things, can I break them down for just a moment? Increased faith. Everybody's got a measure of faith. Hallelujah. But I want my faith to move mountains. Amen. 
And it's going to take some great faith in order for me to endure some of the things that I have to go through in life. Can I get a witness? Somebody. Amen. So I like the sound of increased faith. How about intense motivation? Intense motivation. Hallelujah. I got a workout partner at the gym. When he is with me, I work out in half the time that I would if I was by myself. And there's two of us waiting to use something. But it's because the whole time I'm with him, it's, come on, come on, come on. You're too slow. You're too slow. You're slow. You're slow. You're slow. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Pick it up. Ah, what you breathing for? What you breathing heavy for? He talks garbage to me for one solid hour, and I like it. Because if he did not stand there too long and twirl my thumbs and take too many breaks, and there's something in fitness called time under tension. The more you can do in a shorter amount of time, the more tension, the more growth you got. Sometimes things have got to get stressed and tight in order for you to grow. Amen. It's not until you are pushing up against resistance that is opposing you. And you've got to say, uh-uh, you're not pushing me back. I'm pushing you back. Amen. Intense motivation. Joy unspeakable. How many know you can have that? How many know that as a Christian, you can be in a season of grieving and still have joy? Hallelujah. Joy unspeakable. How many would like to live that way? Come on, somebody. Christ-like compassion. Jesus had compassion on the multitudes. Hallelujah. And he would break down and have compassion for just that one right in front of him. Amen. Creative thinking. We need that. We need that. The church can invent the next iPhone. Right? Think about how much that one invention changed everything you thought about that when did we get the iphone like oh two oh three oh four five six eight, something like that 2010 i don't know i know facebook was like oh seven of the inventor of that amen come on we can do that too we are the church we are the people of god we can create something bigger than facebook sorry facebook Hallelujah. We could create something bigger than an iPhone. Amen. God's people are called to step out in holy boldness and play a part in setting up a kingdom culture here and now. Are you ready for it? Amen. I want that. This past Sunday as we brought our first message from this all new series, we proposed learning how to establish a kingdom culture by closely examining the very parables that Jesus taught concerning the kingdom. So we began with the parable of the sower found in Matthew chapter 13 where we saw that we have to be the kind of soil that continually receives seed. Not just initially, but continually. And allows it to take root, to take precedent in their life. Because without his continual living word, there is no kingdom culture. Amen? People can talk about kingdom culture all day, but there ain't a kingdom without a king. And there's not a king unless you are adhering to his word. Amen? A real king is when he speaks. Hallelujah. And people bow down to what he says. Has our lives begun to bow down to what the word of God says? I'm starting to feel kind of good in this little prim and proper Bible study tonight. Amen? All right. With that said then, we want the living word. We want it and we need it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break down some parables that Jesus taught. And that's all we're going to do for two solid months. But we're going to know these kingdom parables. Is that a deal? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we praise you. We love you. We honor you and we thank you, God. Lord God, you've given us ears that we may hear tonight. Let no distraction take us away from this time of study. God, we thank you for those that are dedicated tonight and being in your word. And we thank you for your word. For it's in your name we pray. Somebody say amen. All right, Matthew chapter 18. My first focus point tonight is this. Give me that, guys. True greatness in a kingdom culture. What is true greatness in a kingdom culture? We've, as a society, we've seen so many things be called greatness. 
And many times we award greatness to somebody that does something incredible. Like I was talking about the iPhone a while ago. That's an incredible thing. And uh, the Amazon guy that went to space the other week, that's all great and good. Uh, but when we see greatness, we think of people like Michael Jordan, who not only uh, played basketball, but he played baseball, and he won all those uh, uh, world championships. We think of Muhammad Ali, and we think about how for so long he was unbeatable and all the different things. We have seen greatness. We've seen Tiger Woods out there, and he won the Masters uh, just a few short years ago when many said that he was washed up, he was done, he was over 40 years old. We saw Tom Brady last year solidify himself as the greatest of all time uh, as he is my age and still playing in the NFL. We've seen our culture call things great, right? And we've seen it in everything I just described, like it or not. That's some great stuff. But people are always thinking, what is great? What's revered? Because greatness is going to bring power. And everybody wants some level of power somewhere. Everybody wants that, right? Now, where we are in this portion of Scripture, Jesus has just instructed Peter to catch a fish, and in his mouth, there would be enough money for them to pay their tax. And guess what Peter does? He goes down there, he catches a fish. The first fish he catches, he looks in his mouth, and lo and behold, there's enough change in his mouth to pay the tax. That would have just solidified everything for me. There would have been no more doubting, no more kicking and cussing. I wouldn't have to cut nobody. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, opens up the fish and finds the exact amount he needs just like Jesus told him. That would have done it for me. Hallelujah. But we then pick it up right here in the very next chapter, verse 8, I mean, excuse me, chapter 18, verse 1. Are you with me? It says, at the time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's the greatest? Because they just saw something pretty great. Amen. There won't no David Copperfield around that time. Amen. This won't no magic. This was the hand of God. For God to say there will be a coin. Amen. Well, all, look, G, all Jesus had to say was the very first fish you catch, you'll find enough money in his mouth to pay the debt that we got to pay. Right? Jesus just spoke it. There's things that I'm going into uh, in the next season that might not be there yet. But if Jesus wants me to have it so that I'm covered, all I got to do is get a word from God. And when God speaks it, even though it might not be there right now, it'll be there when I get there because of the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. We pick it up right here. It says, who is then the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2, then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, what did he tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. And converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What? The Bible tells me when I was a child, a reason like a child, a thought like a child, I act like a child, but when I got older, I abandoned my childish ways. Now, am I supposed to be childish or not? Right? No, you're supposed to act like you got some sense. But when it comes down to it, I am a child of God. Amen? And even, look, listen, I'm a child of Danny and Betty Parker. Hallelujah. But when I go over to their house to eat, I no longer sit in a high chair and eat applesauce. That would look ridiculous. Amen? No longer does my mama try to get in front of me and say, no, you, 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 you. Woo, woo, woo. no more of that. <laughs> Amen? I've grown up, but I'm still their child. Amen? Meaning, I've grown up some, I've grown up a little bit. I don't know now. Grown up a little bit. But I'm still their child. Amen? Hallelujah. And he's saying to them, 
He calls a little child, sets him in the midst of him, and says, Surely, unless you are converted and become like them, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? A child has no hidden agenda. A child is never trying to use nobody to get ahead. One of the most honest pictures of love that I've ever seen years ago was a little uh, white child and a little black child. Maybe they were, I don't know, two years old maybe, something like that, two or three years old. And they were holding each other so tight. They went to the same uh, preschool or whatever, and they hadn't seen each other in a few uh, because of the COVID stuff. And when they finally got to see each other, they just embraced each other because they had missed each other so much. And it said, racism is not born into nobody. It is taught. Because their natural... Their natural action is, I I love him, I love her, no matter what. Amen? And that's the way a child's mind thinks. They just depend on their parents. Amen? Growing up, I never worried. And if somebody had to worry about that, then I, I pray for you and God had his hand upon you. But I never had to worry about, Lord, have mercy. What are we going to eat tonight? I didn't have to worry about that. What am I going to wear? Amen? How's this going? How am, how am I going to have this provided for me and that provided for me? A child just knows that their father is going to provide. They know their mother is going to provide. That is what he is meaning. Humble yourself and have faith to know that God is going to provide for you. You didn't get here by yourself. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. We have to have faith to even believe that Jesus died on the cross so that we can go to heaven. Verse 4, therefore, whoever humbles himself, that's true greatness. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus hollered for that child to come over. That child stopped exactly what it was doing and come right over there immediately. Immediately. And Jesus is about to use the child as an illustration. Whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Everybody's worth time. See, they're asking about stature. They're asking about position, title, notoriety. And Jesus points them directly to the abandonment of all of that. A child is not a CEO. A child is not a manager. A child is not a supervisor. Come on. A child can't be mayor. Right? They they have no clout. They're the ones that everybody's, ah, adults are talking, you go over there. Doesn't matter. Right? He says, I need you to get like them. Jesus points them directly to the abandonment of all that. They had an agenda, and so Jesus pointed them to those who don't, children. They wanted to achieve greatness. They longed for power, and there's nothing wrong with that. But see, the power of God works different. The power of God is different than corporate power. The the power of God is different than political power. The power of God is different than financial power. Because the world tells us that you got to do whatever you got to do to get ahead, and you got to be ruthless, and you got to go after the prize. And that, that is true to some extent. But at the end of the day, the power of God works so different. Because he said, oh, you want to be first, huh? The first are going to be last. The last are going to be first. If you're going to talk about kingdom stuff, you're going to have to get like one of these little children first. And your mind is not in the right place if you're already asking me, what title will I have in the kingdom? Who will I be in the kingdom? Who then is the greatest in the kingdom? Why are we thinking this way? Because we want power. Many people always want to know, I'll do this and I'll invest in this, but what is in it for me? And Jesus says, what's in it for you is the reverse of everything you've been taught in the world. It's for you to humble yourself like a child and totally depend on me. And they like being the rock stars of their generation. They like traveling around with famous Jesus that everybody was gathering to see. 
because he could do and say things nobody had ever done or said before. But here's the thing. He's the son of God. He wasn't there to do tricks. He wasn't there to entertain. He wasn't there to perform. He was there to disciple. He was there to raise up. He was there to implore and implement. And that's exactly what he did. And they like the fame, and there's power that comes from fame, but you have got to be willing to want the power of God. And the power of God will sometimes put you at the back of the line. The power of God will sometimes isolate you to a point that you feel like you can't tell nobody what's wrong. The power of God will overcome you at times, and you'll have to obey God in such a way that you'll have to tell something to somebody that may make them mad at you for the rest of your life. The power of God can be hard on that person. But we look at this and we look at notoriety and we look at prestige and we want that, but we don't want the bitter cup that can come with those things. Give me the teaching point tonight, the first one. What kind of power are you drawn to? What kind of power are we drawn to? We live in a time right now where ministry scandal is on the rise again. Growing up in the late 80s and early 90s, I, you saw it. It was heartbreaking when we still see it. But now we're starting to see it. And with that said, people are drawn to celebrity-style churches, and they're drawn to the churches that are reaching the celebrities. I will not stand behind a pulpit and shout nobody down, but I am telling you, if it's not real, people are going to have their problems. They are going to have their issues. Amen? But come on, somebody. At the end of the day, if they're not trying to honor God and reach people for the cause of Christ, God's power will expose it. What kind of power are you drawn to? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. My next portion of Scripture is going to be verse 6. And my focus point is God's precedent upon the humble. God has a precedent, a mark, if you would, that he has put upon the humble. Amen. Jesus once said, he that exalts himself shall be humbled, but he that humbles himself shall be exalted. This is the way you live. We've seen boasting we've seen braggadocious behavior in those who are great we have we've seen that when Muhammad Ali would go to the ring he would tell you exactly what he was going to do to the man right we've seen that and we've been taught that that's what greatness is and there's nothing wrong with being confident and he was a showman I know that but at the end of the day, Jesus teaches that greatness is found in humility. Amen? And that's not what we've been shown in our society that greatness is. Greatness is loud. But Jesus can put some eyes on you when you're quiet. And you're not needing those eyes. And so most times in a true, sincere, genuine situation, you don't even know the eyes are upon you. Okay. He says in verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones, he goes back to the child illustration. Whoever calls one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he would drown in the depth of the sea. Jesus takes a pause break to tell you a truth nugget. And that is, hey, by the way, when you're in charge of one of these, Make sure you lead them right. They don't need to see everything you see because they're not ready to see what you've seen. Amen? So be prepared in how they see things. It don't mean that we're fake and we're phony, but there's things they don't need to hear. There's things they don't need to see because they'll need to make a decision as they get older of what road they're going to take. But while they're under your care and they cannot fend for themselves, amen, you have to lead them in the right way. If you don't, you would be better off if you just had something heavy tied around your neck and you were sitting at the bottom of a lake. 
now. I don't think that'd be better off. So what is he telling us? Give me teaching point number two. Great influence comes with great responsibility. Amen? Hallelujah. I don't ever want to show my kids a hypocrite. Amen? Great influence comes with great responsibility. And we can't always help it. But God will give you great influence. And then you can't say, well, I don't want to be accountable and I don't want to ha- be responsible for having this. No, no, no. You can't help what you're responsible for. God gives us people. Whether it's a child of your own or a child you're mentoring. Great influence comes with great responsibility. Skip down to verse 10. Are we, we're almost done. Is anybody getting anything out of this? Now he goes from a live illustration, now he's fixing to go smack dab into a parable real quick. Jesus continues to teach, and he shifts from a live illustration to a parable. And my focus here as I close out is this, Matthew 18, verse 10. The God of many is the God of one. Amen? The God of many is the God of one. He said in verse 10, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven... Their angels, look at that. You ever seen that before? Their angels. It gives ownership of the angels to the kids. Their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Do you think that your God is so loving that he has assigned angels to your children? There's proof of it right there. Don't discount these little citizens. These little people, you got to humble yourself like them. Their angels are always in God's face. Amen? I love that. That my grandson has an angel assigned to his life. Come on, somebody. That my children have an angel assigned to their life. How many things has God kept us from walking in and falling in because he had assigned an angel? Hallelujah. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more, more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He will do all he can to save that which is lost. Many have interpreted this to be pastoring 101 because pastors are likened to shepherds. You ever heard that? And you may believe that, and I used to believe it too. Oh, this is a picture of pastoring. You leave the 99 and you go after the one. And that makes you a great biblical pastor. But then the more I read it, this is talking about the love of God and how God will leave and go after that one. Amen? Because he can. Because, see, God is omnipresent. Meaning, he could come and minister to me and never leave you. Because his word says he'd never leave us nor forsake us. In order for me to come and hunt you down, I got to leave the rest of them. Amen? God can do that because he's omnipresent. I can't do it. If that, if that, come on, somebody, if Braden come up here tonight, Pastor Daniel will not be here tonight to preach. He's out hunting for missing members. <laughs> we hope he'll return Sunday. What do you guys want to do tonight? Like, wait a minute. We love them, but we're here. Where are you at, Daniel? Amen. 
This thing's about God, y'all. <laughs> Because only God can go running after somebody and not leave everybody else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yet it really is about the heart of God towards us. So we'll see that despite the enormity of his kingdom, he still knows us and will come after us. Give me this last teaching point and I'm done. Watch this. God will leave the stable to go after the unstable. Thank you, God. Everybody that loves Jesus doesn't always have it all together. And they don't look at, they might not be as strong as they look on the outside. Anybody can lose it for a little while and go through some things that would cause, but I serve a God that will come after them. My pastor used to say it like this. Come on, we can let people know all day long how much we love them, miss them. Amen. But come on, if something took somebody, out on their own, it'll they'll be brought back on their own. Amen? Because we serve a God that'll go after them. Because his people, at some point, you're just harassing folks, you know? I mean, I done called him five times. I, I, don't, I, I love him. It's harassment. Leave him alone. Folks will be where they want to be. It don't mean we ain't been biblical. Well, pastor, you didn't go after the one and leave the 99. I did. Hallelujah. Yes, I have. But come on. I still got to be there for the 99. I serve a God that can hunt down anybody I pray. And God, if there's anybody that's supposed to be in this room tonight, hunt down their heart right now and shake it, God, and show them that they need to be in your house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This parable is about the heart of God because God can do things that I cannot. Amen. As I close tonight, let what Jesus said establish such a natural standard in you that you can't help but implement a kingdom culture. When I was in radio, they would send us to a marketing seminar every year. And everything, Pepsi was there, Hardee's was there. Uh, different companies, and everything was all about marketing. Let the message be short. So when God gave me all about him, that kind of also fit in with the marketing I had learned in radio years ago. The shorter, the easier to remember, all of that. And so I was, it was ingrained in me to always notice what a company or an organization has to say, their, um, their mission statement or whatever or their logo, or their brand, or their calling, or their slogan. Ours is all about him. Another one we have that's kind of rising up is lives change here. But I saw Walmart the other day, and Walmart had a good commercial like they always did, and their slogan, do y'all know Walmart's slogan now? Save money, live better. Walmart. Oh, man, that's good. I mean, that says it all. Save money. And when you're saving money, you're going to live better. Walmart. That's pretty bold. That means you come in our store, we know you're going to save money here. And that's going to help you live better. That gets a hold of somebody's attention real quick. In the kingdom, I say this. Get saved, live better. Get saved, live better. I didn't say get saved and be perfect. I didn't say get saved and you'll never fall. I didn't say get saved and all of a sudden you're a theologian. I said get saved and you'll live better. That's kingdom culture tonight. Amen. Did anybody receive anything? Come on and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We'll, uh, we're going to announce our prayer request tonight, and then we'll pray for people in person after we go off the air. Amen. But tonight, I want you to... If we have anything that has come in online, go ahead and bring it to me now. Anything from the box, go ahead and bring that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start reading some of these. And I'm trying to remember several from memory. Um, okay, this is good. 
All right, I know this one. Uh, Lawrence Ellis family. This is the owners of Marty's Barbecue. We need to be lifting them up. Uh, just tragic, tragic. He has passed away. Mike Edwards, father. Andrew Edwards, son. Both have COVID. Both are on a respirator. Amen. We need to remember those families. Um, Rhonda Wolfman. God heals her from COVID. Hillary Jones. The surgery did go well. We give God praise for that. Gwen Deans is having bypass surgery. It went well. Fred Meadows. Prayers for his mom, Cheryl Meadows. She has been in and out of the hospital three times in two weeks. Still no answer to what is going on. Um, also, let's continue to remember Stacy Flora. Stacy Flora from Flora's Jewelry. Good man. Gone too soon. We miss him and we love him. And we're thankful that he's in the arms of Jesus. Also today, um, Casey Neely Pearson, she had messaged in that uh, a person in her life had passed away today. And that information is on my phone, and I don't ever bring my phone in here. So uh, Casey's probably watching tonight. She watches us online a lot. She's in Pine Tops, I think. And Casey, we are praying for you, dear. We're lifting up your family. Also, um, be lifting up Neil Joyner. Our uh, head usher, his mother, Willie Mae Joyner, she's gone into the hospital tonight as well. They think it's a stroke. It's, an, it's a stroke. And this is not the first one. This is another one. Okay. Is that three fingers she just held up or two? Three. So let's be remembering her. Also, my dad uh, got really bad off yesterday with high ammonia levels, which caused him to be so uh, mentally altered that he could not remember how to walk at all as far as how to shift his legs and to move them uh he was progressively we thought he'd be better by now we did everything that they normally do at the hospital that we've learned with this sickness he has cirrhosis and he was not getting any better so the ambulance came and got him today i took my mother and had to drop her off while she was there she got really um bad off herself with her heart um at and so she had some heart trouble, and they've admitted her now. So we've got both of them up there. So we need prayers for our family, amen, because we got to uh, uh, to work something out of who's going to be with who. Now we got both of them down. And so we really need some prayer tonight, amen. Hallelujah. How many know that God can and he will? Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to pray over these knees tonight, and then I'm just going to ask the church to come up, and let's pray in the altar before we leave tonight for anybody that's comfortable. Father, we come right now, God, and we just give you, Lord God, these, these names tonight. God, these names that you know, that we may not all know, God, but you know them. You know every situation. And so, God, we're asking you to bring peace to Kaylee Pearson and her family. Lord God, we ask that you bring peace to, to Stacy Flora family, Lord God, and God, we just ask you tonight, those that are suffering from sickness and disease, God, we're praying for healing tonight. God, we just ask you right now, God, hallelujah, just to bring healing, Lord God, to my dad and to my mother tonight, God, help her, Jesus, strengthen her, Lord God, strengthen her for this journey, God, hallelujah, God, just help our church, Lord Jesus, keep our church safe, keep our church protected, God. Lord God, for those that are out right now, God, may they stay plugged in online, Lord God. Hallelujah. And not lose sight of who you are in this time. Not lose connection, Lord God, with their home church, God. I pray this tonight, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, for protecting us, Lord God, and helping us to be here tonight. In Jesus' holy everlasting name, we plead, we proclaim, and we say amen tonight. Amen. I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. Can we thank our online audience, everybody? We'll see you Sunday morning at 10 o'clock with another installment from Kingdom Culture. Good night, everybody.